In the 30 years of its history, Australia's great race, the 1,000 kilometre sprint around Mount Panorama, has grown from a purely local spectacle to a world-class motor racing event. It certainly ranks with other classic races like Le Mans or the Indianapolis 500. The 29th edition of the great race, they're racing off the starting line. We take Chopper Camp. But it's also Australia's great television spectacle. It's sent live across Australia and New Zealand, and it's seen by over 350 million people worldwide. The kick initially, but they're all through the first turn and heading up mountain straight now. The length of the race and the size of the audience means the live 10-hour telecast is particularly intense, and it's also a huge technical undertaking. Jimmy Richards back in third. And it looks to like cover the race, Channel 7 plugs in 31 cameras around the 6.2 kilometre circuit. It fits five in-car cameras, wrestles with 40 tonnes of cabling, links four outside broadcast vans with three dozen videotape machines, aims 16 microwave dishes and can generate enough power to light a small town. Add to that all the sound requirements for a stereo broadcast and it's not hard to understand why there's not much equipment left at the studios during Bathurst week. The Bathurst race has always attracted cameras. In the 50s and 60s, when live coverage was unthinkable, just a couple of cameras would do the job, and if you missed the action, well, cut in a few extra shots, and no one would notice. Back to third now. And you make a fairly With these line. big roomy cars, a cameraman could easily sit in the back, and as long as the driver didn't go too fast, you could get some idea of what the circuit was like. The driver could even say a few words. Down through the dipper, just clipping the fence. How tame this looks to us now. Just missing the fence. In 1979, Channel 7 showed the world the first high-quality live pictures from inside a race car. Every armchair became a passenger seat, and television turned a big corner in motor racing coverage. The system has been bolted into race cars all over the world and each year refinements are added. Today's race cam is not much lighter than the five kilogram original but unlike its predecessor which was fixed this camera can rotate 360 degrees, tilt up and down and focus and zoom. A tiny aerial on the roof of the car links the camera by microwave to its operator, but not directly. Since a microwave signal is blocked by any solid object, trying to beam a signal directly to the van would be impossible. Instead, a helicopter acts as a sort of flying reflector, collecting the signal beamed up to it and retransmitting that back to the van. So we take race cam inside Peter Brock's mobile Commodore. This system is work. almost perfect. The only signal loss occurs as the cars go under the bridge down the main straight. As if being a video passenger wasn't enough, there's also a number of tiny fixed cameras scattered around, inside and outside the car. Floor cam, roof cam, pit cam and door cam provide a more comprehensive view of the race than even the driver could ever hope for. The cameras are driven from a tiny darkened room on the inside of the track. Each camera is controlled by a video game type joystick. This is the tiny lipstick camera and this rig is known as pit cam. These sorts of cameras were originally developed as medical tools to look inside the human body. But here, this one's been mounted on top of a pole so that it can peer and pry into places where previously only mechanics could get to. But for the real motor racing enthusiast, colour and movement is not enough. Sound is also an important part of a day at the track. Every camera on the circuit has a microphone mounted alongside it. But no one has yet invented a zoom microphone that can perform like the camera's 55 to 1 zoom lens. The camera lens can bring a car that's hundreds of metres away into full frame long before a microphone could ever pick up the sound. So there's another microphone linked to this camera but positioned about 100 metres up the track so that when the picture of the car is up close, so is the sound. 
As the car approaches the camera, the top mic takes over. But as the car passes and the camera pans, another microphone down the track has to be faded in. Mixing the sound like this from every camera on the track would be a sound person's nightmare. But Channel 7 engineers have come up with a very simple solution to a problem no one else has solved. Under the head of the camera is a clear plastic disc that mixes the sound automatically. The camera rotates above the disc along with a photo sensor. These are rings of black tape with gaps in them that correspond with certain camera positions. As the camera pans with the car, the photo sensor acts like a switch. When a gap in the tape arrives, light shines through the perspex and switches on the microphone. And there's been a refinement to the basic system. The tape is tapered. This allows for a gradual increase or decrease in the light and therefore the voltage. So really what you've got is a built-in volume control fading the microphones in and out. 36 cameras generate an enormous amount of visual information. To make a coherent story of the race, each camera has to be directed and selected at the right time. It would be impossible for one person to juggle the output of 36 cameras at one time, so the coverage is split into packages. This is one of four outside broadcast vans and this handles the vision from just nine cameras, the ones at the top of the mountain. The output from here and the three other vans is fed to a master downstream control area where the live broadcast is assembled and transmitted. When the race was first broadcast live in 1963, it was covered by five cameras and one of them was borrowed. The signal was sent back to Sydney by a relay of technicians who had to camp out with their equipment in the hills. Today, it has become one of the world's biggest television events and it takes a full four days to repack all the cables and load the vans for the four-hour trip back to Sydney. Early footage of the race looks quaint to us now. We're used to the increasingly dramatic coverage of the last few years. But to stay ahead in the race, next year Channel 7 promises helmet cam. And they've even been approached to turn race cam into space cam and fit cameras around the outside of the space shuttle. I'm sure that's a ride Dr John can't wait to take.